Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great privilege for me to be here and to share, share such a global perspective on uh, an issue which um, affects New Zealand, where I'm from, as well. And I want to draw some of the parallels between our two very different um, parts of the world. This is the city I live in, Wellington, New Zealand, at the bottom of the earth. <laughs> New Zealand has a population of about 4 million, so just over half Hong Kong's. It has a population density in our major cities of one hundredth of Hong Kong. So the differences are extraordinarily extraordinary. So you can see from this picture, it's, it's a low density environment, recently settled in historical terms. And people arrived there in 1840s. Yet Europeans arrived there in 1840s, I should say. Um, so what this uh, provides for me is an opportunity to share some of the experiences in New Zealand, very briefly, with those that have been uh, encountered by the last few speakers. And I think the parallels are very interesting. I want to begin, and I'll draw those parallels I'll go, as I go through. I want to begin with the difference between the way we have analyzed cities up to the last 10 years, when we have used data um, from what I call on the ground particularly census data. These are data that are reported by individuals about their particular circumstances, where they live, the number of rooms, their incomes, and so on. This is the city of the ground. What we're now seeing, and Professor Ho's uh, presentation indicated an example of this, was the growth of interest now in the city of the mind. These, now we're beginning to ask people what they think about their life experience in cities, as opposed to simply measuring their income, their rental status, and so on and so forth. So this is quite a change in the way we begin to think about living in cities. And I think the change is very insightful, particularly um, in light of uh, Richard Sennett's comments at the beginning. We sometimes call this objective versus subjective, or external versus internal, and there's other names used as well. What I want to suggest, and this is a challenge to all of us, is what is the relationship between the city on the ground and the city of the mind? One of the interesting areas of research in the whole uh, quality of life happiness studies is the disconnect between the objective and the subjective in some areas under some conditions. But we're also interested in the way the city of the mind can inform us about what we should do about the city on the ground. And this, if you like, is a, a plan is a challenge to the planners. How can you take subjective well-being responses and turn them into changes in the physical infrastructure and the way cities are spatially organized? So what is subjective well-being? Well, we've had a brief introduction, so I'll, I'll move forward relatively quickly. There are a range of measures, but these are probably the most common ones. A measure of happiness, a measure of satisfaction, a measure of quality of life. Now, these do not measure the same things. If you correlate the two, they're not perfectly correlated. There are some people who are highly satisfied, but not happy. People who have low quality of life who are happy. So the choice of measure is actually particularly important. In a very similar question to Professor Ho's, this is the way the satisfaction question is asked, and the other questions are asked in a similar manner. And so you have a, a Likert scale of anywhere from three to 10 observations, and you model the responses to those questions as a function of a, a number of possible explanatory factors, which I'll introduce now. My, qu my question to this literature comes as a geographer, I'm a human geographer, and so therefore I'm interested in the geography of subjective well-being, or if you like, the difference that place makes. There is a geography of, of subjective well-being for a number of reasons. Firstly, places differ. Secondly, people differ. Thirdly, people and place interactions differ. 
And thirdly, and fourthly, people have a limited choice of place, so they cannot necessarily move to places that might make them happier, or more satisfied, or improve their quality of life. So how do we estimate the effect of place on subjective well-being? We are, I believe, just at the beginning of this broad research agenda that is taking place around the world. And with the British survey arriving in 2012, uh, where the British are going to be able to analyze subjective well-being at a regional level, I think simply because the number of researchers there, um, we're going to see a, an explosion of interest in the geography of subjective well-being. I was able to get into, into this a little bit earlier because we have a survey that goes back to 2002. So um, this really is the beginning of something we'll see a lot more of. And so the, our debate today is very timely. The uh, paper, the information I'm drawing from, it comes from a, a paper published last year in regional studies. Basically what we do is we take a measure of subjective well-being. It could be happiness, it could be satisfaction, it could be quality of life, it could be stress. And we ask the question, what effect does location, or the city of residence in my case, uh, have on satisfaction? Some people look at neighborhoods. The British are going to look at regions. Those different scales are probably going to yield different answers, so we have to be very sensitive to scale. There's no point in looking at the relationship between satisfaction and location alone. And that's why surveys of quality of life in cities uh, without any controls that don't tell us a great deal. This is because the composition of people differs in cities, and therefore we must control for that composition. And when we control for composition, we introduce terms, uh, measures like person's age, uh, their sex, whether they have a partner or not, their um, health, often self-rated, their levels of education, whether they're employed or not, their income, and their ethnicity. We can, if we have the right measures, in introduce Professor Ho's um, measures of uh, love, insight, fortitude, and engagement. Okay. I've gone a little bit further than this by introducing another set of variables, which I have called evaluations of accessibility and social capital. Because as you'll see in a minute, I noticed that cities in New Zealand, people did not yield the same subjective well-being, even when we control for people's attributes. So the question is why? And so I was interested in asking two questions. How important is accessibility to people? And how important is social capital? I'll cover those in a minute. Let me just quickly show um, what happens when we measure the probability of being very happy, the PVH here, post-estimated from an ordinal probit regression. What we find is that the, and we arrange the cities on this dimension from those parts of New Zealand that are, very, that are apparently most happy and those right through to those least happy. And what we see is that down at the bottom, we have our most dense, largest city where we see happiness levels lower, lowest, controlling for all those attributes I measured, mentioned earlier. Now, this is particularly interesting in light of uh, Professor Charles' comments on the Chinese situation, because what he referred to was... But would it be possible not to go into too much detail? Sure, we, sure. If you can just... Okay, except that um, what this tells us is that agglomeration forces, which are very important for raising productivity, are inconsistent with increases or relative increases in quality of life. So I think this is one of the big challenges we have, how to grow faster but also increase quality of life. So very briefly, um, I'll skip over this. So why are people happier in, in, in some places than others? What do I find? Well, very high density matters negatively, even when you control for those other things. Accessibility to services does matter. Inaccessibility to services has a huge effect on people's um, well-being. We expect, because we come to cities, to be closer to services. If we're not, we get very upset. Social capital and trust are enormously important. And the, 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 the love list that uh, Professor Ho uh, suggested 
is present in here. Your degree of interconnection, right from your presence of a partner through to your friends, and above all, your degree of trust in people is phenomenally important in understanding happiness. So contrary, perhaps, to Professor Sennett's uh, initial distinction um, between uh, ability to connect to strangers, when we can connect to strangers, when we have a strong network, this does actually make us happier and increase our quality of life. And there's a lot of unknowns. I'll leave you with another picture of Wellington. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.